What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. Today we're going to be taking a look at the very real and pretty mysterious story of Tom and Eileen Lonergan, a couple who disappeared at sea after being left behind by their dive boat on a trip to go and see the Great Barrier Reef. You'll have likely heard of this story before because a film was actually made about it, which is loosely based on the real events. And that film is of course Open Water, which is ranked by many as one of the most underrated shark films. I think one of the things that people must love about the film is that it is based on true events, which makes it just that little bit scarier. So today we're gonna to be looking a little bit deeper into the real version of events. We'll learn about the mysterious evidence that came to light after their disappearance. And we'll try and figure out if Tom and Eileen Lonergan were truly attacked and eaten by sharks. So let's rewind all the way back to 1998. The Lonergans headed out on a dive trip run by dive tour operator The Outer Edge with 22 other divers on the 25th of January, 1998. They'd just returned back from a two year stint with the Peace Corps and felt like they couldn't miss out on an opportunity to go and scuba dive on the Great Barrier Reef. The couple were relatively experienced divers with Eileen getting a qualification back when they lived in Louisiana. And she loved it so much that she convinced Tom to also take up the hobby and both of them had dived together on a number of occasions before. The group of divers were diving off St. Crispin Reef which makes up a tiny tiny fraction of the overall Great Barrier Reef. To give you some perspective it's about 38 nautical miles from Port Douglas on the mainland. The divers on the boat that day were scheduled to do three dives which is pretty standard for shallow water dive trips. The first two dives went off off without a hitch, but it was on the third dive at a dive site known as Fish City where it all went wrong. The Lonergans, who considered themselves to be relatively experienced divers, told one of the crew members that on this last dive, they wanted to go off and explore the reef on their own. And so they did, but when they surfaced to their horror, the dive boat was nowhere to be seen they had officially been abandoned. The events that unfolded next from Tom and Eileen's perspective are of course unknown, but we do know what happened from the perspective of the dive company. A headcount had supposedly been ordered by the boat captain, but confusion ensued when two people who had already been counted in that headcount jumped back in the water. And when they got back in the boat, they were counted again, which means that the headcount was obviously incorrect. When the Outer Edge boat headed back to shore, a crew member later found an unattended bag on the boat. Presuming it had been left behind by one the divers who had already exited the boat when they got back to shore, the crew member placed that bag in the lost and found. Meanwhile, the hostel at which Tom and Eileen were staying at had sent a shuttle to come and pick them up from the dive center. But when they didn't show for the shuttle, the driver decided he was gonna have a look around some local bars and restaurants to see if he could find them. Having no luck with that, the driver decided to call the dive center to try and see if he could find where Tom and Eileen were. And after calling the dive center, it turned out that both Tom and Eileen's pairs of shoes were still in the shop. But the driver and staff member at the dive shop presumed that Tom and Eileen had left their shoes behind and had managed to find their own way back to the hostel without telling anyone. I tell you what, there's a lot of presuming going on in this story so far. Anyway, the following day, the Outer Edge boat took another group of divers out to the very same reef that they'd been the day before, completely oblivious to the fact that Tom and Eileen were missing. And a diver on that trip reportedly found six dive weights on the sea floor and brought them back to the boat where a crew member described it as being a lucky find who then took them back to the dive center. Two days after Tom Tom and Eileen went missing, Outer Edge owner Jack Narin had noticed that the bag that was retrieved from the boat still hadn't been claimed from the lost and found. He looked inside it and found Tom Lonergan's wallet and becoming increasingly concerned, decided to call the hostel where Tom and Eileen were staying and discovered that they had never returned to that hostel. Finally, the owner of the dive company contacted the police and a massive search and rescue mission took place 48 hours after the couple had gone missing. 48 hours. You hear the stats about how important those first few hours are after after someone goes missing. But this was 48 hours after, and at sea as well. It's almost a death sentence. The strange or perhaps negligent thing here is though that none of the members of staff who work at the dive center had noticed they were missing two BCDs and a number of dive weights. Having worked in a dive center myself before, I can understand how they might have missed the dive weights, but something like the BCDs, they are bulky items. I'm not quite sure how they could miss those. To be fair, they could have been a relatively busy dive center. They did have 24 divers on that first trip, so that's a fair whack of equipment. Anyway, after a week long search and rescue mission from both air and sea, the search was called off and the Lonergans were presumed to be dead. End of story, right? Well, 
Not quite. A series of strange discoveries in the months after their disappearance only added to the mystery surrounding the incident. And those discoveries led to a number of different theories from people around the world trying to figure out exactly what had happened here. In the months after the couple had disappeared, fragments of evidence started to wash up on beaches in the area where they'd gone missing. The first was a woman's wetsuit found in North Queensland in February 1998 four weeks after they had disappeared. The wetsuit just about matched the size of Eileen Lonergan and it was scientifically examined to figure out how long it had been at sea. The scientists examined barnacle growth on the zipper of the wetsuit and had calculated that it had been lost since the 26th of January the day after the couple had been left behind. The wetsuit was also revealed to have tears and rips in the armpits and the buttocks. Although those examining it believed they had been caused by the wetsuit getting snagged on bits of coral as it had drifted across the reef. As opposed to the other perhaps slightly morbid hypothesis, sharks. A few months later, both Tom and Eileen's BCDs washed up on a beach north of Port Douglas, along with one of Eileen's fins, none of which showed any damage or tears that you might expect had the couple met their demise by sharks. Several months later still, a fisherman discovered a floating dive slate about 100 miles north of the dive site, but the haunting message that was discovered on this floating and weathered dive slate was written by Tom Lonergan, and it read, Monday, Jan 26th, 1998, 8am. To anyone who can help us, we have been abandoned on Agincourt Reef by MV Outer Edge, 25th of Jan, 1998, 3pm. Please help to rescue us before we die. Help. Other strange discoveries at the time include passages from Tom and Eileen's private diaries, of which some of the entries led people to believe that the Lonigans had intentionally gone missing and had in fact made a suicide pact. Both were revealed to be unhappy in their lives and in their marriage. Eileen showed that she felt too intertwined with her husband, who had developed an expiration wish. And Tom's diary backed this up with a passage stating, Like a student who has finished an exam, I feel that my life is complete and I am ready to die. Although slightly disconcerting, the families of the Lonigans maintain that these excerpts from the diaries were taken out of context. And considering the dive slate was found with a clear help message, it does suggest that they didn't stay behind by their own choice. Another strange story surfaced a few months later though, which led some people to develop theories that Tom and Eileen hadn't had a suicide pact but they had instead faked their own deaths. Another boat captain came forward to the police during their investigation, claiming that he had visited the dive site where Tom and Eileen had gone missing the following day with his own group of divers. According to his story, the headcount before his boat returned to shore came out two more than when it had left port. The divers on his boat that day were all Italian and of course were speaking Italian, but the captain claimed that on that day, he also heard American voices amongst the Italian voices. This story of course led some to believe that the two additional heads that were counted on on that boat were the Lonigans who were trying to slip away unnoticed. More than 20 people came forward during the investigation claiming to have seen Tom and Eileen in different parts of Australia after they had disappeared. But if they had truly done this, the couple really would have had to start their lives completely from scratch. They'd left their passports behind, their bank accounts remained untouched so they'd have no money, and importantly here, they'd have voluntarily decided to spend the night in the water on the Great Barrier Reef, an area of Australia that has a whole host of marine life that could potentially harm you, including sharks. On top of this, they'd have to hope that the boat that they were on did the head count incorrectly, and the following day, another different boat would return to the dive site that they could slip onto and disappear. It all sounds a bit wishy-washy. There's too many ifs and buts for this theory to be plausible. According to locals as well, St. Crispin Reef has winds and currents that are erratic and can go in any direction, which means that Tom and Eileen probably drifted a fair whack of distance in those first few hours that they were in the water. In the film depiction of this story, the stranded couple are surrounded by sharks relatively quickly. They get a few test bites before eventually succumbing to the sharks. I know, I know, spoiler alert. But the question remains, is this actually what happened to Tom and Eileen? Were they killed by sharks? And to answer it, we've got to have a look at the location and the available evidence. St. Crispin Reef sits towards the northern middle section of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. The waters up there are pretty wild. I've snorkeled and dived them before. And January, the month in which Tom and Eileen disappeared, would have been the height of summer for Australia, and the waters up there would have been pretty warm. This takes out great white sharks 
sharks for sure who have only been occasionally seen on the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. But those water temperatures are perfect for tiger sharks and bull sharks. Port Douglas, which is where the boat departed from, has seen shark attacks in the past, most notably on spearfishers, one in 2004 and another one in 2014. So it wouldn't be unheard of in the region for sharks to bite people. But we now need to come back to the evidence that we have available to us. Tom and Eileen's scuba gear, including their BCDs, their oxygen tanks, and one of Eileen's fins were all recovered, none of which showed any damage from sharks. Alongside probably Eileen's wetsuit, which did have rips and tears in it, although those tears weren't consistent with that of shark teeth. And no blood residue was found on any of that gear. So what we could say here is that sharks didn't attack Tom and Eileen while they were in their scuba gear, nor while Eileen was in her wetsuit. But that's not to say that they didn't take them off while they were out floating in the water. People would ask, why would you take something like that off? Surely a BCD with loads of air in it is gonna help you float in the water. Well, people do strange things when they're dehydrated and the Lonigans were probably dehydrated within the first 24 hours of them being abandoned. People have hallucinated or even tried to drink seawater when they've been extremely dehydrated. So it's not out of the realms of possibility that Tom and Eileen released their floating aids while they were in this state of mind. Alongside this, hypothermia might have started to kick in after that first night they were in the water. And yes, you can get hypothermia in tropical waters. In severe cases of hypothermia, again, you can get hallucinations, and also your body might start to feel like it's burning up. There are several examples of paradoxical undressing, which is where someone who has severe hypothermia starts to take off all their clothes because they think they're getting too hot. And it's this fact which could have led at least Eileen to take off a wetsuit, which would then go on to wash up on a beach a few weeks or months later. It's of course impossible to know exactly what happened to the Lonigans after they were left behind by the boat. But I think there's always a chance that they were attacked and perhaps eaten by an opportunistic shark species like a tiger shark. Whether they had succumbed to the elements before this had happened, we'll never know. But the fact their bodies were never recovered leads me to believe that at some point in the days after they went missing, sharks were involved. Tiger sharks in particular are opportunistic shark species and will eat literally anything they can to survive. And if you were to ask me, yes, I do think the Lonigans eventually were consumed by a shark or multiple sharks. The sad reality here though is that after Tom and Eileen had surfaced and realized the boat was gone, they were only about two to three kilometers away from three pontoons that were used by the dive boats that visited that site to tie up and wait while the divers were in the water. If they could have got to those pontoons, they likely would have survived at least till the following day. But at water level, or even on a calm day, something like that would have been so hard to spot. It's easy to see something like that when you're stood on the deck of a boat, but when you're just above the surface of the water, it's almost impossible. And they only had about five hours of daylight left on that first day to be able to get to those pontoons, because by the time night fell, they would have drifted miles and miles away in the currents. It's a pretty tragic event all around, and one that probably could have been avoided had the dive company been a little bit more competent. The owner of that dive company was tried for manslaughter but was acquitted by the jury. Although he was again tried in the Australian civil courts where he pled guilty to negligence. And the court fees and the fines from this case led to him having to close down Outer Edge as a tourism operator. But the events did lead to some positive changes in the Australian dive industry with some stricter rules being put in place on how they operate. And importantly, how dive companies do their head counts. So what do you guys think happened to the Lonigans then? Was it sharks that were responsible? Or are you a firm believer of one of those other wild theories. Let me know in the comments. At some point in the future, hopefully this season, I'll be doing a movie commentary right here on Shark Bites all about open water. So as and when I do, I'll make sure that it crops up on the end screen somewhere around here in the next 10 seconds or so. Please do give it a watch. But for now, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button below. It's really, really appreciated by me. Make sure you subscribe to the Shark Bites channel by clicking that big red subscribe button and make sure your notifications bell is turned on. And that way you can make sure you stay up to date with all of our latest videos. Until then, see you next time.